This video is brought to you by Audible. Go to audible.com slash YBOC or text YBOC to 500-500 to get a free trial. Plus, it just really helps the show. Hey there, nerds, and welcome to another installment of Your Brain on Cracked. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Breeding, with doctor, of course, being spelled D-O-C-T-E-R, which stands for Documentedly Terrible at Acronyms. And this is important because today, I'm mostly just diagnosing dicks and boobs, and, and YouTube, before you smash that demonetize button, allow me to clarify that dicks and boobs is also an acronym standing for dumb ideas, cinema kind of suspects and believes. Oof, about sexy parts. Foo, dodge that bullet. Uh, anyway, so insert segue here. Let's look at breasts. Nice. Breasts sure do take up a lot of our time. I mean, we worry if they're big enough, we question if we really like them, and we definitely spend a lot of time thinking of ways to touch them. And that last one is probably the greatest driver of progress in human history, because what were the Apollo missions if not an attempt to touch the great big rock boob in the sky? And yes, that's a, a super weird thing to say, but not as weird as some of the bizarre things that Hollywood writers believe about breasts and dicks, including... Much like internet weirdos who believe that pee is stored in the balls, filmmaking weirdos seem to be under the impression that sexiness is stored in the breasts. It's why so many sexy female characters look like they're wearing a necklace made out of medicine balls. <laughs> So if breasts are intrinsically linked to sexiness, then by that weird-ass logic, a woman who has more than two breasts has a surplus of sexiness in her sex sacks. So she might as well sell it by becoming a hooker or a stripper, according to a surprisingly large number of screenwriters who probably write their movies you know, one-handed. Like, everybody remembers the triple-breasted prostitute that offered some triple-X action to Arnold Schwarzenegger and Colin Farrell in the Total Recall movies, but did you notice the alien cat stripper from the beginning of Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, and how she was also incapable of sleeping comfortably on her stomach? It appears we have lost our sex appeal, Captain. Star Trek has more than 100 different alien species, which come in all shapes and sizes, but when we finally got one with an extra mammary gland, that character just happens to be a stripper. It is difficult to explain. Counselor Troy's body was a cake. Her upper body. Then you also have the Return of the Jedi and its exotic dancers in Jabba's palace, like the six-titted Yarnadol Gargan, whose name, I believe, translates to a revealing glimpse into George Lucas's personal preferences. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. Now, Hollywood is willing to admit that too much of a good thing can be bad for you. I mean, not cocaine, but, but teats, because sometimes those extra nipples are what Satan uses to suck your soul out and turn you into a grotesque monster, is the metaphor I'm gonna use, because, yeah, we're definitely demonetized by now. Anyway, that's presumably why the harpy in The Last Unicorn has three very human orbs, though she does flap them wildly around, so maybe that also counts as a stripper? And uh, maybe something that a certain doctor would enjoy uh, for his birthday? There is only one thing that has ever made me happy. Then there's the demon with three gourds on the TV series Angel, but in her dialogueless appearance, she seems to be also working as an escort, so once again, we're back to multi-hooters being linked to sex work. I guess maybe the only truly unsexual character with additional Elmer Fudds I can think of is the giant monster from the Metalocalypse music video that runs around ripping off guys' testicles, which, again, is probably something some dudes are into. Ah, sex work again. I do cocaine. Now let's look at wieners. Eh. On Parks and Rec, Gary Gergich is a low-level employee for the government and an emotional human toilet for his co-workers. Jerry's so-called friends routinely and viciously insult him, like hucking literal pies into Terry's face and consistently calling poor Larry by the wrong name. <laughs> But the thing is, even the writers of the show felt bad about treating the character this way, so in season five, it was revealed that Gary has an incredibly beautiful wife and equally beautiful daughters, all of whom adore him in a way that you rarely see outside of cults. But this wasn't the writer's first instinct, because way earlier in season four, they revealed that Gary has a gigantic yogurt pistol, one of the biggest his doctor has ever seen, in fact. Gary's big old beef thermometer was supposed to make us feel less sorry for the man. Like, it's cool that people loathe his presence because his dong could sink a ship. A very similar thing happens with Cyril Figgis, a timid, frail comptroller working for a spy agency on Archer. Cyril gets so little respect on the show that him merely offering to help out with a computer problem results in his coworkers just sh** all over him, figuratively, not 
literally. No, literally. You mean figuratively. But it's okay, because in the series' second episode, we learn that Cyril has a 12-inch tube stake. Figuratively. The fact that Cyril is also highly educated and trilingual all comes much later. When Archer writers wanted to make sure we don't feel too bad for Cyril, they immediately pulled out his massive boink rod and patted it to assure us that whatever abuse we throw his way, he can deflect its impact with his mighty meat sickle. Well, I get to learn karate. Karate? The Dane cook of martial arts? No. Other examples include Zach Young, on Desperate Housewives, Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, Chris Griffin from Family Guy, and David Spade on Just Shoot Me, which is both the name of the show and what I want you to do if you ever catch me watching David Spade. <laughs> Convicted murderer Amanda Knox will write an advice column for a Seattle newspaper. The working title right now is Dear Stabby. <laughs> This is taken to absurd, creepy links in The Hard Times of R.J. Berger, a show about a bullied, nerdy 15-year-old boy with a gargantuan pink pop sickle. Oh, look at that! I just got added to a 10th government watch list. Wow, now the FBI has to visit me for free. Thank the Lord for this bountiful <laughs> penis! Bountiful penis! And speaking of being demonetized, we don't have to worry about it because we're sponsored by Audible. And speaking of Audible... Her face and vagina are competing for my attention, so I glance down at the billiard rack of my penis and testicles. Figuratively. <laughs> so, that, so that might sound like a crazy Chuck Tingle romp, but actually it's a pretty good book. I was just playing it out of context, because that's what I do. Uh, it's called The Destroyers by Christopher Bolin, and it's this pretty good like thriller set on this Greek island about this guy that gets mixed up and stuff. And uh, speaking of being mixed up on Greek islands... Audible has legitimately been kind of a lifesaver the last few months. I don't know if you can tell, but uh, I don't live anywhere sexy like New York or Los Angeles or anything, so I've been traveling a lot for work recently. And thanks to Audible, I, I have this like massive selection of content to listen to. And it's not just audiobooks, they've also got these podcasts and even meditation guides, and all of which I can listen to through the app and on the go, and it's an uh, incredibly helpful distraction when my commute is to freaking Austin, Texas. And all you gotta do to get in on this goodness is head over to audible.com slash YBOC, or just text YBOC to 500-500 for a free 30-day trial and immediate access to, like, thousands of things on their Plus catalog. And if there's something specifically that you want, if you sign up, you get a free credit every single month that you can apply to anything. And if that doesn't convince you, I'll tell you what, they do have Chuck Tingle on there. And there is something extra magical about hearing the prose of Pumped by a Pirate. It really, really brings it to life. Oh, and speaking of... <laughs> Shakira's hips may not lie, but in Hollywood, neither do breasts, because if they do lie, something horrible will happen to them. For some reason, American movies tend to believe that fake jugs or jugs enhanced by unnatural means are evil. And much like the faux fun bags themselves, Hollywood's hatred for mock melons isn't exactly subtle. Like, there are many signs in Back to the Future Part 2 that Biff is a real butt bag, but none are bigger than the two that stare Marty right in the face when he wakes up from his second concussion in as many movies. Mom? Mom, that can't be you. In this timeline, Biff has married Marty's mom and forced her to get a boob job because, you know, him just turning the U.S. into a place where you can get killed for stealing newspapers wasn't enough to establish his, uh, villain cred. He also had to go and mess with nature, that monster. In Bruce Almighty, the movie quickly establishes that Jim Carrey is using his literal god powers incorrectly by making him enlarge his girlfriend's frost detectors. In the 1972 Woody Allen movie, Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask, there is a segment titled, Are the Findings of Dr and clinics who do sexual research and experiments accurate because Woody Allen does not know the difference between writing a movie title and an entire freaking book or an adoptive daughter and a date. Well, my disgustingness is my best feature. The segment tells the story of a mad scientist obsessed with maleficent mammary enlargement and ends with a solitary massive boob terrorizing the countryside in a parody of the blob, a, a, a boob blob, a, a bloob. It's a boob blob, folks. Hollywood also punishes women just for wanting bountiful, bouncy, bodice boogie bobbles, which is why when Kitty on Arrested Development gets knocker implants, she's punished for it by having her boob job turn out all weird and lopsided, like, Maybe this will teach you to love your body, you deformed freak, the series says. Can we please have one conversation that's not about my wreck? And then there's the scene in Leprechaun 3 where a woman wishes for bigger breasts and the titular evil leprechaun causes them to expand until they explode. Bigger is good. 
But Jumbo is dear. I'll give you boobs that come out to here. You also have Mean Girls, where the Queen Bee's mom, played by Amy Poehler, had a boob job so botched that she doesn't even feel when a dog basically bites her nipples off. And no, I'm not done. I still haven't mentioned Crank 2, where a prostitute gets a bullet shot through her implants. And I don't mean to be crass, but whoever wrote that definitely gets a boner while reading the obituaries. And speaking of stiffs, here's another great segue. <laughs> Everyone loves a villain, and sometimes even more than the hero, which is why Cruella got her own movie. While we'll probably never get to see Pongo's twisted origin story, where he reveals that he was a good boy who just wants a tubby rub. <laughs> but Hollywood is always worried about making their villains too likable, which is why they have to write a bunch of undesirable character traits in. Like how most villains' wieners don't work good because they're bad. In Kick-Ass 2, you have McLovin find his mother's S&M gear and become a supervillain named the mother f***er, presumably causing Freud's body to spin in its grave at the speed of light. But despite the name, McLovin is a wimpy, pitiful bundle of emotional issues and lameness, and yet the studio was still afraid we'd somehow identify with this this insane character. So they gave him ED when, when he was trying to rape someone. It's played for laughs, but it's about as hilarious as walking in on your dad quietly crying alone in the garage. We should have gone. He's to gone! He's dead! <laughs> in The Departed, Matt Damon's Colin Sullivan is a police officer secretly working for the mob, and to make sure that gullible kids don't start, you know, infiltrating law enforcement agencies for crime families, the movie makes Sullivan impotent. And although the character might possibly be doubled secretly gay, the message is still the same. Crime ruins your sex life. And speaking of double secretly, the president of the stuck-up Omega House from Animal House also has trouble getting it up. So does one of the criminal bodybuilders from Pain and Gain, and yeah, I mean, I guess it didn't help that he was on a lot of steroids, but that's not the point. The point is that if uh, you want some vicious rock hard erections, be nice to others. Open doors for old ladies and the boners will follow. I think Confucius said that. The thought of me dead gives you an erection? No, just half of one. The other half would have really missed you. Hollywood will even tack impotency onto real people if they don't find them villainous enough, like when they made the bank robbing outlaw Clyde Barrow and Bonnie and Clyde uh, unable to squirt. Hell, in Dr. Strangelove, it's implied that General Ripper went crazy and triggered a nuclear holocaust because his private stopped standing to attention. A malfunctioning pocket rocket literally destroyed the world in that movie. I can deal with his impotence, I cannot deal with your incompetence! And I need another segue, so let's pretend that my name is Steven, which is an acronym for segue, terrible. So the video ends uh, now. Oh, I'm Roger, by the way. And I'm back. <laughs> <laughs>